be open and hear from you. We yes, ask Lord. Help our hearts not to be too proud yes. or cluttered, not to be closed or stubborn. Help us to hear you. Yes, Lord. And then, Lord, help us to, to respond. Help us not to just let the words come in and us soak them up, but help us to live them out in yes. our life, yes. in our words, in our thoughts, in everything that we do. Yes. We pray, Lord, you'd speak to us and that we'd hear you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. As we continue a series of messages, Walking to the Cross, we're going to see how a little man meets with a big God. Luke, chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. Please follow along as I read. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was a short, of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. May God bless the reading of His Word. You may be seated. So there's a story about a fitness center whose owner offered $1,000 to anyone who could demonstrate they were stronger than he was there at that fitness center. What happened was the owner, one of those muscle guys, muscle men, he would take out a lemon and he would squeeze it with his strong hand and he would get every bit of juice out of that. And then he would hand that to the person who challenged him. And if that person could even get one drop more out of that lemon, he would pay them $1,000. Nobody could do it. He had that kind of grip weightlifters, construction workers, professional wrestler even came to try it and couldn't do it. Then one day, a scrawny looking guy, short, skinny, he came and signed up for the contest. And uh, (laughs) after the laughter died down, The owner came out, did his usual bit, and he grabbed that lemon and he squeezed it until nothing else would come out of it. And then he handed it to this little guy who was challenging him. As he took hold of that lemon, he started to squeeze it. And he got six drops of lemon juice to come out of that thing. And the owner was stunned. I mean, he was in awe. Nobody had ever done that before. And uh, so he asked him, he says... He says, how in the world did you do that? He says, what do you do for a living that would make you that strong? He says, I'm an IRS agent. (laughs) So have you filed your taxes yet? (laughs) Plenty of time, plenty of time, no panic, no worries. Um, 
here's an actual letter that was sent to the IRS office. This happened several years ago, so you probably heard it. I know I've, I've told this story once a couple of times before, maybe. Um, said, enclosed, you'll find a check for $150. I cheated on my taxes last year, and I haven't slept a wink since. If I still have trouble sleeping, I'll send the rest of the money next year. <laughs> okay. Picking on IRS agents because that's who Zacchaeus was. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Um, <laughs> Zacchaeus was a tax collector who knew that something was missing in his life. You heard that Jesus was coming that way. By the way, if you remember last week, we talked about Bartimaeus, and he was on the outskirts of Jericho. And as Jesus came by, Bartimaeus yelled out to Jesus, Have mercy on me, and Jesus did, by answering his request. As a matter of fact, I challenged some of you last week to, to answer the question, If Jesus asked you, what, should, what would you like me to do for you? You see, that's what he asked Bartimaeus. He said, what would you like me to do for you? And if Jesus were to ask us that question, what would your answer be? Several of you said that you would like healing, just, just like Bartimaeus. And, and I believe this. I believe God promised that in his time, he would heal us. But you've got to remember some things. One of the things Jesus said, it was because of his faith. Because Bartimaeus had faith in Jesus, then Jesus' power was healed him, brought his eyesight back. But it started by his faith. We know that it's God's power, by the way. You, you and I, we don't control God's power. We can't manipulate God to do things on our own time or to do something that, that he doesn't want. We have to wait on God's timing, and God's timing is always perfect. Oh, God's timing is always perfect. Even if you don't think it is, it always is. Because in His time, God weaves together all the events in our lives, in our lives as we connect together, and He brings glory to Himself. And the reason that's so important is because that's the only way that people are going to be saved, is when they see God lifted up, when they see God, they'll be drawn to Him. Zacchaeus, in some ways, was drawn to Jesus, But you notice it didn't say that he just wanted to see Jesus. It said he wanted to, <laughs> he wanted to, I, I need to look down and, and get it so I say it the right way. He wanted to see, not, not just see Jesus, he wanted to see who Jesus was. See, it wasn't about just a, a visual thing. He wanted to know more about Jesus. And so he made a plan. Being a short man that he was. I'm sure he saw the big crowd, you know, many people, and he'd be far enough away that there's no way he's going to see anything of Jesus or get to know more of what he was like. And so Zacchaeus formulated a plan. He uh, ran ahead of the crowd, got up a sycamore tree, and he waited for Jesus to come by. You see, I want you to note, this is the first thing in your notes, I, I want you to realize that Zacchaeus, he was seeking Excuse me, he was searching as a sinner. He was searching. Zacchaeus was a searching sinner. His name in the Hebrew, Zacchaeus, his name in the Hebrew means pure and righteous. I want you to realize that nobody in Jericho thought of Zacchaeus of being pure or righteous. Zacchaeus, it points out, was a tax collector. <coughs> Excuse me. A tax collector in those days was someone who worked for Rome. And Rome had conquered Israel. Rome was in charge and they were oppressing the Israelites. Uh, they would take taxes, I mean, far beyond what we know. And certainly less fair than we know, even though you might protest and say our taxes aren't fair. Because here's the deal. Uh, Rome would employ, they'd, they'd pick people to be tax collectors. They'd put some in charge. And by the way, if you read that, you'll find out that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Which means 
that he was over at least three guys and maybe more than a dozen guys that collected taxes. Now, being the chief tax collector meant that he could add a percentage on top of what Rome wanted so that he could get more money. And Zacchaeus was very rich. And he was rich off, the ta- the, off of the taxes and, and off the labor of all of those people that lived in Jericho. And by the way, Jericho was a great place to be a tax collector too because it was the, the city that was kind of like on the way to Jerusalem. And everybody, every year, was supposed to make a journey to Jerusalem so that they could celebrate the Passover. And so Jericho was one of those on-the-way places. And so as soon as you get in there, there's going to be some taxes about coming into Jericho. If you're only going to be a guest, there's guest taxes. By the way, do you know we have those in America as well? If you look at your hospital bill, or hospital, excuse me. Don't look at your hospital bill. If you look at your hotel bill, the, the city, the county, the state, there's taxes on your hotel bill for just being a guest. And so uh, we're not that far from all the way back there in Jericho. Well, Zacchaeus was good at his job, and he collected lots of taxes, and he was rich. And uh, he also, by the way, the folks, the Israelites, they saw Zacchaeus as a wicked man. He was a traitor. As far as all the Israelites were concerned, Zacchaeus was a traitor because first he was representing Rome. He was taking Rome's money, uh, or he was taking the Israelites' money and giving it to the Romans. And so everything about Zacchaeus was hated by all the Jews, the Israelites. So he, while in some circles was very popular, with his own kinsmen, he wasn't welcome for anything. So finding his way through a crowd of Jewish people that are following Jesus just wasn't going to happen. He was going to be closed off because of his lifestyle. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, if we could say that would never happen today? But there are people that we kind of have an aversion to. There are people that we kind of automatically don't like them all that much. Maybe it's because they wear different clothes than we do. Maybe it's because of different ways that they have done things. Maybe it's because of what they do. And we could very easily end up just like all the Israelites there in Jericho. And because somebody doesn't fit in with us, we aren't going to let them around anything important to us. But I want to tell you that God has assigned us to go unto all the world. We don't have the luxury. We don't have the choice to say, hey, I don't like this person. They won't fit in. We don't want to let them here. That's not our choice. This is not your church. It is not your Sunday school class. It is not your small group. And if you want to know the truth, it's not your family either. God gave each one to you. This church is God's church. And He invited us to be part of it and to become a body that fits together. But God is going to use everybody to make this church complete. Not just your favorite people. Zacchaeus just wasn't welcome. Zacchaeus was out there treated like a traitor. And all the religious people put a uh, tax collector. And, and actually, in, uh, in the book of Matthew, there's a, there's a way that... <laughs> it says that the tax collectors and the sinners were the ones that Jesus met with for lunch that day. And in the... In the uh, <laughs> In Israel, they related tax collector and sinner together as one. They were the same thing. I wonder how, what we label as the same as sinner. But you know what? Let me make it easy for you. All have sinned. Every one of us are sinners. 
Every one of us could be labeled just like Zacchaeus was on that day and all the days before as a sinner. Somebody who's fallen short of God's plan for their life. That's every one of us. So we're all sinners. We all deserve the judgment and Jesus has given us a way out. But He gave it to everybody. It's God's desire that all be saved. <laughs> there are some who believe there's only a select few that are going to be saved. I don't believe that. I don't believe it because the Bible tells us that God so loved the world. God loves everybody. And it is God's desire that all men be saved. Now, for the doctrine that says that there are some that are elected, let me, let me just give you a, a little thinking to do about that. Although God knows what is going to transpire in the future, He knows what choice you will make, God hasn't made that choice for you. And God, even though He, he knows the future, even though He knows what choice you will ultimately make, even though God knows that, God still sends messengers. He still sends people. If the hope that you would change your mind. But most of all, to show He loves you, even if you reject Him, He still loves you. While we, we were yet sinners, Jesus died in your place, in my place. You and I, we don't know who those people are that already made up their mind to go to heaven. We don't know who those people are that haven't made up their mind yet because they haven't finished letting God do the work in their life. And so we need to be concerned about every soul and reach out to everyone that perhaps they all would be saved. Amen. Well, let me uh, get through a couple of things here. Uh, Zacchaeus' wealth and success was, um, was great. It was renowned. I mean, he was, he was the leader, the chief amongst the tax collectors, so he was very good at what he did. But he wanted to see who Jesus was, so it's evident that something's missing in Zacchaeus' life. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, on the social structure of the city of Jericho, because Zacchaeus was rich, because Zacchaeus had it in good with the Romans, then all the people that didn't care about the Romans or all the people that were Romans that are living there, they all, you know, they, he was pretty high up in the city. And so whenever he threw a party, he'd throw good parties because, you know, he'd buy the best stuff. And so everybody would come to Zacchaeus' party. But Zacchaeus being wealthy, Zacchaeus being fit in the social structure of, of, of Jericho, there was still something missing. And I want you to think about this social structure because I want you to get the picture of how desperate he was to go and seek out and find what was missing in his life. Here he is, this high in stature, very wealthy man who is running around. He's got his, his good clothes on. He's got his good sandals on, the nice shiny ones so that everybody knows he's rich. And he's running down the side roads so that he can get to a tree and climb a tree. Can you imagine uh, somebody of stature in our town? Maybe our mayor running around on the dirt roads on the back. <laughs> so that he could climb a tree. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to be a target today, did you, Pat? You? Cherry, tree Cherry tree, apple tree, yeah. Well, Zacchaeus found a sycamore tree, and with all of his fancy clothes on, he climbs up there so that he could see more of who Jesus was. See, I, I want you to get the picture that Zacchaeus, although society had him up there on the ladder, although his money had him up there on the ladder, he knew something was missing in his life, and he was desperate to find it. Yeah. Now, here's the, the next part of the story that I love so much. Jesus was actually seeking him. Jesus was actually seeking Zacchaeus. So if you want to write in the blanks, you see him up there. Search, uh, the seeking Savior. When Jesus came to that sycamore tree, He stopped. He looked up and he saw Zacchaeus. And he told him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. 
for today I must stay at your home. <laughs> Zacchaeus may have come to see what Jesus was like, but Jesus came so that he could meet with Zacchaeus. He was seeking him out. Jesus took note of him. Could you imagine? Here's Jesus with a whole crowd of people around him. You know, and, and by the way, Bartimaeus just got his eyesight. So that's got everybody stirred up. And everybody's following Jesus in through the town, squeezing in between the buildings and all that kind of stuff. This whole crowd is coming. Zacchaeus knew he couldn't see Jesus. But here we are, this whole crowd following Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops. I can't help it in this case, but to think that maybe this was one of those occasions when the disciples, you know, just... I mean, they probably stumbled over each other to try and stop because they, they were on a mission. Do you remember what Jesus told them right before they got near Jericho? He said, we're on our way to Jerusalem. Jesus had already set his sights on his mission that he was going to die in Jerusalem. And so on his way there, he came by, and just on the outskirts of Jericho, he met Bartimaeus. And now as he's going through Jericho... On the way to the cross, Jesus sees Zacchaeus, and he stops. And all the disciples start bumping up against each other, trying to stop and not fall overward. And folks are looking around saying, what in the world did he stop for? And then Jesus looks up. And I'm pretty certain that there were a lot of people that looked up there with him. There's a man in that tree. <laughs> what in the world are you doing up there? Oh, that's not just any man. That's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus? The tax collector? You're kidding me. He climbed up a tree? Well, I hope he stays there. <laughs> you know somebody had to think that, don't you? But Jesus stopped. By the way, something else fantastic about this is that Jesus knew his name. Oh. I, we need to stop just for a moment. If there's any way that I can put a marker in your thoughts, something urgent to remember today, that is that Jesus knows your name. Amen. He knows you. He knows your name. By the way, He knows your hideouts. <laughs> he knew He was up there in that tree. He knows where you live. He knows what's in your, in your heart. And here's what Jesus said, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down from that tree because I'm going to your house today. Wouldn't it be awesome? It is awesome, not wouldn't it be. It's awesome that as we sit together today and we hear God's word and we see that God loves Zacchaeus and that he knew Zacchaeus' name, and he wanted to go to Zacchaeus' house and spend the day with him. It would be so awesome if this little marker that I'd like to plant in your thoughts would remind you that Jesus knows your name. That Jesus knows where you live. And he knows what's in your heart. And he loves you. And he would, he would today. He would tomorrow, with every day left in your life, if you'll seek out Jesus, you'll find that He's already looking for you and that He's ready to spend the day with you. If you and I would stop in the first part of the day and recognize that Jesus is there, right there with you, right there in the bedroom, right there at the kitchen table, whenever it is that, that you get woke up enough that you have your senses about you. Two coffee cups later, I don't care, whatever it is. When you finally recognize that you're starting your day and your thoughts are starting to process of what comes next, wouldn't it be great if Jesus were to interrupt you long enough to say, hey, I'm going to spend the day with you today. He's already made that promise. He's already going to be with you. He already knows you, and He loves you in spite of your sin. And He wants to forgive you of your sin. 
you and I, you and I just need to take pause and have the faith that this message from God's Word is true today. That God so loved you. And that He would spend the day with you at your house. Now, I, I can't help but <laughs> can't help but mess with you a little bit. <sighs> Some of you know when somebody says they're acting like Martha. Some of you know what that, that means. And if uh, right now, if I could just say that in a physical sense, Jesus is going to go home with you today, some of you would start having little palpitations, you know. And you'd want to hurry up and get there before Jesus did so you could clean the place up. Amen. I can see you driving really fast, getting home, getting that. And, and I, I don't think for a minute that Martha would reach for the broom. She'd just throw it at her husband. <laughs> Sweep it up! And then Martha runs into the kitchen and starts fixing up the best food that you had, sets aside the macaroni you was going to serve the family, and gets, I mean, if we knew he was coming, can I tell you, it'd be a great way to live your life by faith, believing that every day Jesus is going to be in your house with you. I wonder if we could see him physically, if we could see a physical presence of Jesus. I wonder how much our daily life would change. I wonder if we'd have time to have coffee with him if he was right there at the house with us. I wonder if we would have time to sit there and tell him about the burdens that we have for the day and how much we'd like to have his help. If he were right there so we could see a physical presence, we wouldn't get so busy and be in a hurry and ignore him like we do now because we can't see him physically. But let me tell you, he's nonetheless there. Jesus is there in your house with you. He wants to hear about your burdens for the day. He wants to, to tell you how much he loves you and that he is ready to spend the whole day walking with you through every experience you're going to have. He wants to be there with you. But we have to be aware of this. And this is why it's so urgent. And that is that our sin separates us from God. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 59. It says that our sin separates us. I know I don't have to tell you what sin is. But I want to point out to you that sin doesn't have degrees like we tend to make them. There's not one sin that's worse than another sin, which means that any sin is going to separate us from our fellowship with the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to be saved. I'm saying that you're not going to have good fellowship with God because of sin in your life. When you and I start acting like <laughs> those Israelites, and we have conditions about how everything works, and we try to make everything our way like those Israelites did, in the church that day and, and in the church in the day of Zacchaeus and Jesus walking there, uh, that sin separates us from God. Remember I reminded you that the church isn't yours, not mine. It's His. Jesus gives him a command that day. Come on down, I'm going to go to your house with you. I wonder what the Sadducees, I wonder what all those religious people thought about Jesus going to his house. You see, every time in the New Testament here that Jesus goes to a sinner's house, there's always some kind of Pharisee, Sadducee, some religious person that's sitting there thinking, well, you're not supposed to have lunch with sinners. That means <laughs> if... If you and I didn't want to have lunch with sinners, we wouldn't be eating. No, you wouldn't even be eating because you'd be there even by yourself. But you're a sinner, so you can't eat with them, right? Here's what happened real quick. The Scripture says, and it uses in this text, they began to mutter 
is one translation of the Greek word. They began to, they began to grumble a little bit about Jesus having lunch with Zacchaeus. And, and I, I, want you to, I want you to understand that that muttering is defined as a low grumble that indicates complaining and finding fault. So when those guys, when all of those folks started to complain, those religious people, they started to complain that Jesus was having lunch with him, they were finding fault with Jesus. Wow. They were finding fault with him. They were, <laughs> they were grumbling. They were complaining. We don't complain, do we? Okay. Hey, Kathy, can, can, can I give you one of these? There we go. There we go. She needs the oxygen on. She's got it there. Uh-oh. I'm sorry, Miss Kathy. I didn't know I was going to get Edwina in on it. You know her. Yeah. Thank you. Last thing. Zacchaeus experienced a spectacular salvation. In, in the scripture, it tells us in verse 6, so I want you to look there with me again. It says, so uh, Zacchaeus made haste, and he came down and received Jesus joyfully. And verse 7, but when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of all my goods to the poor. I want you to note a couple of things, very important. And I got to see something new on this occasion, um, on this study stuff. But here's the first thing I want you to recognize. And that is that Zacchaeus was not negotiating with Jesus. Zacchaeus wasn't saying, hey, would it be all right if I only give half my stuff? Now, let me tell you the tradition of the day. The Pharisees and the Sadducees who were there complaining that Jesus was having lunch with a sinner, they had a custom that if they were going to be recognized for their generosity, they would give as much as 20% to the poor. Actually, if you'll know the truth, the research said they would give a top end. The most they would ever give to the poor was 20%. That was it. They weren't going to give more than that. And, and the scripture says Zacchaeus offered up, not, not trying to argue, negotiate, not trying to justify. He wasn't even asked by Jesus to do something with all this wealth that he accumulated off the backs of all of these Jews. What he, would, what he was doing is Zacchaeus was expressing the change in his heart. He got up at the dinner table and he said, look, Jesus, I want you to know. That, that my heart has changed and I'm going to give half of all that I have. I'm going to give it to the poor and let them do with it so that they are all well. 50%. Some of us struggle giving 10%. Some of us struggle with giving anything to the poor because we... We're only going to give what we budget. Well, then Zacchaeus said, and I'm going to give four times what I stole from people. I'm going to give it back four times over. Now, that reflected something in the law as well. The Levitical law said that if, if, you, if you voluntarily, if you volunteer to uh, give back something you stole, nobody caught you, the sheriff wasn't pounding at your door, and you said, oh, wait, wait, let me give it back to him because I stole it. That doesn't cut it. If you gave it back voluntarily, though, nobody knew, and you just were convicted, and you give it back. The Levitical law said that you should give two times what you've taken back. Now, if you got caught, only if you got caught were you to give four times. You see, here's what Zacchaeus was doing. He was saying, look, by me getting to know Jesus and my heart is so changed, I feel like I have gotten caught. And I want to be forgiven. I want to clear the slate. And so I'm going to give back the maximum that's expected. I want to give back the most that people give back when they are found out to be thieves. 
And I found out this day Zacchaeus said to be a thief, and so he gave back four times what he stole from people. All of those things, even in Zacchaeus' mind, it's very clear he didn't even care about the money anymore. It wasn't about money. It was about, I have a changed heart in Jesus. Now, some of us need a changed heart, and it's not about the money in our life. Although that can become an evidence of the condition of our heart, the real thing that Jesus is after today is for us to not be embarrassed to chase Jesus. For us not to be apprehensive about having Jesus in our daily life or in our house or to be with us all day long. What God wants to do is to come into our lives and be there as a permanent part of how we live. There's some of you today that you don't have the, the, the guarantee. You don't know that you're going to go to heaven. Oh, you've been in church. You're in church today. God bless you. Let me tell you, that's great. And I, I, would, love, I would love everybody in, in the West Plains to come into some church, but I'd like them all to be here. Of course, that'd be a little difficult, wouldn't it? I'd like us to be ready to invite about 100 people new into our church this year. Wouldn't that be great? Except I don't know 100 people, so you're going to have to help me. But let's not worry about who they are. They might be a sinner. That seemed to be Jesus' preference on this day. Zacchaeus, come down. I want to go to your house. He invited himself to somebody's house. And you and I hesitate to even take one of these little cards and invite somebody to come to our church. I want to challenge you. First, if you don't know for certain that you would go to heaven if you died today, then I'd like you to meet with Pastor Leroy for just a few minutes. I'd like you to have the chance to make sure that according to what the Bible says that it takes for someone to be saved, that you have the confidence that you've done that. That you have believed and accepted Christ. Now, Pastor Leroy and some of our other counselors are going to go out to the conference room and the kitchen and, and they'll just take a few minutes. We're not going to keep you a long time. Just take a few minutes so they can tell you exactly what the Bible says about how you can know that you're saved. How you can know that you're going to go to heaven when you die. And even if you've been in church a long time, maybe you've been a member of Airway Heights forever, God bless you. I'm glad. But if there's even a little doubt about where you would go when you die, would you, would you go and talk with them? They're going to meet you at that back door right there where Pastor Leroy is standing. And they'll just take you up the hallway to the kitchen in the conference room. And so in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And when we do, I'd like you to go over there. If you have a question about where you're going to end up, I think that's urgent. I think our church needs to be making sure that people have confidence in what God said and what's happened in their hearts. God has said that He'd give us peace that passes understanding. Here's the peace, I think, that changes everything is that my sins are forgiven and I get to go to heaven. That brings peace. Pastor Leroy and the counselors will make sure that you understand that. Now, the rest of us, those of us who are pretty sure we're Christians, we, we have some confidence that we know the Lord and that we're going to be saved. God bless you. I'm glad that you can enjoy that peace of knowing you're going to heaven. But here's a question for you. Do we measure up to Zacchaeus? You see, I shared with you how he changed. His heart was changed because of the love of Jesus. And his words and his actions become evidence that he believes. So much so that it's not about the things that he has or the position that he held. Now it's about doing something that shows the love of God. What about you? What marks the change in your life? You see, here's, here's some evidence the Bible says is that when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be changed. And, and we're going to be, the old way that we used to live, that's going to die. And a new way of living is going to come to pass so that people look at us and say, they must be one of them Christ-like people. They must be one of them believers. Look at how they live. They give stuff away. It's not about how we gather and hold on to it or collect. It's how we give it away. It's how they live. Their life isn't lived for their own 
passions and hungers, their life is lived for a greater purpose, and that's the Lord Jesus. Oh, look, they're not ashamed to say they're Christians. They're not ashamed to be in a church and be part of a church. They're not ashamed to be part of a plan to reach out to a community. They're a part of something that's bigger than just themselves. That's the challenge for you today. If you've fallen short of that, the Bible says it's very simple to get back on track. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus and no to the devil. And no to your own passion that you might follow Jesus. So I'm going to offer to, you know, invite you to come up and we're going to pray with you. If there's things going on in your life as a Christian that, that you need some help with, some prayer with, we'll make sure to have somebody with you and pray with you and make sure that, that whatever help that you would like to have, we'll provide it. Because I really believe that it's time for us to help change the world starting right here. Let's stand. Now again, if you're...